12th of May 1990, the President of the Czech and Slovak Federal Republic entered the Assembly Chamber of the Council of Europe. It was an emotional parliamentary assembly that welcomed the former political dissident, the figurehead of the Velvet Revolution, who in 1989 brought an end to the communist regime. In his welcoming address, the assembly president paid tribute to the courage of one of the key figures of the opposition in the Czechoslovak Socialist Republic. And you, Mr. President, are a symbol of the victory of freedom over totalitarianism. In his speech, the philosopher president, an atypical politician, spoke of his years of opposition and dreams took the place of hope. Everything seems to point to the fact that we should be not be afraid of dreaming of, of what seems impossible if we want something impossible to become a fact and a reality. Without dreaming of a better Europe, we shall never be able to build it. Following the invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968, which marked the end of the liberalization process of the Prague Spring, Václav Havel remained faithful to his convictions. As chairperson of the Circle of Independent Writers, his commitment led to the banning of his plays. The international community quickly became aware of this dissident. In 1977, Václav Havel co-founded Charter 77, an organization defending human rights in Czechoslovakia. Because of his activities, he was imprisoned on three occasions for almost five years. In 1989, the crowd spontaneously placed Václav Havel at the head of the Civic Forum, an association uniting opposition movements. He became a key figure in the Velvet Revolution. Almost a quarter of a century later, in March 2013, the prize was launched in Prague to honor what Václav Havel was and what he did. Since then, the prize is awarded each year by the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly in partnership with the Václav Havel Library and the Charter 77 Foundation to reward outstanding civil society action in the defense of human rights. For the eighth edition of the prize, the three candidates shortlisted are Lujain al Hatloul, a prominent women's rights activist known for defying the ban on women driving in Saudi Arabia and for opposing the Saudi male guardianship system. The Nuns of the Drukpa Order, a group of young Buddhist nuns promoting gender equality, environmental sustainability and intercultural tolerance in their home villages in the Himalayas. They are known for their delivery of supplies after an earthquake struck Kathmandu in 2015. And Julien Lusenge, a Congolese human rights activist who has been documenting sexual abuse and acts of violence against women in Congo. She was instrumental in obtaining convictions of perpetrators who enlisted child soldiers and collected evidence of sexual slavery. In 1990, Mr. Havel spoke in Strasbourg of the immense strength embodied by the ideals of the Council of Europe. Referring to the organization's emblem, he said that for him, the 12 stars did not express the idea that the Council of Europe would succeed in building a heaven on earth, as there would never be a heaven on earth. But, in my opinion, these 12 stars are a reminder that the world can become a better place if we have the courage to raise our eyes to the stars. And I thank The Václav Havel Human Rights Prize pays tribute to this distinguished European. And it also pays tribute to all those who, through their determined and tireless work, bring us closer to the ideal of a better world. Quite impressive video. Dear colleagues, dear uh, nominees, uh, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me 
great pleasure to welcome you to the eighth edition of the award ceremony of the Vaclav Havel Human Rights Prize. I would like to thank our partners, the Vaclav Havel Library and the Charta 77 Foundation for their cooperation and their incredible work and commitment to preserve the legacy and the values embodied by Mr. Havel, justice and human rights. His courage to fight for them even in the most adverse times when standing up for what is right came with a heavy price to personal safety and well-being. I would also like to thank the members of the selection panel, whose work is underpinned by passion, commitment and conviction. They went through each and every single nomination for very inspiring organizations and individuals that are determined to fight for the enjoyment of fundamental human rights and freedoms by each and every one of us. Ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic has just entered its second year, leaving behind a heavy toll on human lives and the social, economic and cultural lives of our societies, and laying ahead a very uncertain future imbued with daunting challenges. We all have suffered and continue to face formidable challenges in getting about our daily life, getting about our daily life and businesses. I don't, the mic has gone. Can we, yep, here we go again. As I said, dear colleagues, we all have suffered and continue to face formidable challenges in getting about our daily life and business. But it is women across the world that are bearing most of the heavy burden of COVID-19. And that is not only in terms of job losses or being in the front lines where we fight the battles against COVID, the health services carrying the heavy burden of caring for children, the elderly, the family, all while keeping up with professional commitments. And for the millions of people across the globe who live in conflict zones and refugee camps, the situation is even more despairing. The impact of COVID-19 has hit harder women and has further exposed them to the dangers of violence, sexual exploitation and abuse. We can say without doubt that this crisis has further exacerbated persistent discrimination against women and has seen an alarming raise in acts of violence against women all over the world. I therefore see the nomination of Madame Luzange, Mrs. Alat Lul, and the nuns of the Drogba Order a fitting tribute to women's struggle against persistent discrimination and the right to enjoy a life free of, from violence. Vaclav Havel continues to inspire us to dream big. As he said, we should not be afraid of dreaming of what seems impossible if we want something impossible to become a fact of reality. He said in this chamber, and you heard it, he said, the world will become a better place if we have the courage to raise our eyes to the stars. And our nominees have the courage, they have the passion, they have the energy and the determination to dream big and fight for their dreams for a better and equal world. One where women are treated with dignity and respect, where they are given the same chances as regards to education and employment the same opportunities to contribute to society, a society in which they can thrive and prosper. Free from prejudice, misogyny, stereotypes and violence in all its many forms, physical violence, sexual violence, including rape and other sexual violence, female genital mutilation, forced marriage, forced pregnancy, forced abortion, or forced sterilization, or psychological and economic violence. With this price, we honor their contribution to equality and justice, to solidarity, to upholding and strengthening human rights and women's rights. Human rights are women's rights, and women's rights are human rights. That's a quote from former Secretary of State Clinton. Ladies and gentlemen, hard-earned rights are under threat, including in the Council of Europe member states. Efforts to undermine and weaken the protection system against violence against women granted by the Council of Europe legal standards, amongst others and in particular through the Istanbul Convention on Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence, are worrying developments and call for leadership, they call for political courage and firm action to uphold women's human rights. As shown by our shortlisted nominees, 
who I have to, the pleasure to present in alphabetical order. Ms. Lu Zain al Hatlutl, Saudi Arabia, the nuns of the Drukpa Order, Kung Fu Nuns, and Madame Julien Lusage, Democratic Republic of Congo. Now, choosing was not an easy job, for they, in my humble opinion, all deserve this recognition. The shortlisted nominees have shown courage and determination. They are an inspiration for all of us and a shining example for all the women and girls out there. So, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to announce to whom the prize is awarded. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vaclav Havel Human Rights Prize 2020 is awarded to Lujain Al Hatlul. But I would not want to do this without showing the other ones. May I give the floor to the sister, if I get it right, of Madame Al Hatlul. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, I just want to say that I deeply respect um, the Kung Fu nuns and um, Julian Lassange's uh, work. And now I will go um, with my speech. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Lina, and I'm speaking today on behalf of my whole family, uh, as Lujane cannot be present to thank you herself. Um, Lujane cannot be present because although she has been released from prison, she's still silenced inside of the country. My sister Lujane spent a thousand and one days in prison. Her crime? Fighting for women's rights in Saudi Arabia. Lujane sacrificed herself to fight for a better life for Saudi women. She campaigned for our right to drive, to protect abused women, and to end the male guardianship system. Because of her activism, Lujane was kidnapped, deprived of finishing her studies, illegally imprisoned, brutally tortured, put in solitary confinement for months, and now sentenced as a terrorist. For years now, the Saudi regime has been trying to tarnish her image to erase any support and to make her forgotten. But the more time passes, the more Lujane proves to the world how incredibly brave, resilient, and attached to her values she is. She has now become a symbol of human rights defenders in Saudi Arabia. A symbol because there are thousands of detainees going through what she has been through. But silence has become the norm in our country, a police state that will even put families of detainees under a travel ban and force them into silence. Thankfully, some of us are out of the country and free to speak, free to become Lujane's silence voice. But our voice alone is not enough the world needs to recognize her sacrifices and to know who Lujane is. We would therefore like to thank the Vaclav Havel Awards Committee for choosing Lujane this year. International support is the only way we can expose the injustices and protect the victims. We are truly honored by your support. Thank you for giving us strength to continue the fight. Thank you. Thank you very much for these words and above all for the courage of your sister and her commitment in defending the cause of human rights and women's rights. So thank you very much for having delivered these kind words, important words on behalf of your sister, Lu Jane. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our ceremony. Thank you for having joined.
Dear colleagues, now I conclude the ceremony. I was very happy to have all of the three of you uh, on screen. Um, congratulations, obviously, to uh, Lou Jane, who has been awarded the Vaclav Havel Prize. But as I said in the beginning, you all deserve it. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes our ceremony. We will reconvene at 4 o'clock uh, with the President of Moldova. And really, I hope to see all of you in situ after COVID, be it in Saudi Arabia, in Congo, or with the Kung Fu Nans. Uh, I would be very, very glad to be able to meet you in person. Thank you very much for being here, and thank you for all the work you're doing. Good afternoon. I'm Michal Jantowski in the Václav Havel Library. One of the highlights of every year for us here in the library is the award ceremony and the follow-up conference of the Václav Havel Human Rights Prize. Each year, a laureate of the prize is selected from among three finalists by the seven-member selection panel led by the President of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. In what is the eighth year of the prize, the occasion has been made even more special by the fact that all the three finalists were women. This was not due to any deliberate plan or policy on the part of the jury, but simply to the spectacular bravery, spirit and dedication of the women in question. Although, in the end, only one could win, they all deserved the prize. Let me thank our partners in awarding the prize, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, its President Rick Dames, and its Secretary General Despina Chatsi Vassiliou Tsovilis, the Charter 77 Foundation and its Executive Director Bojena Jirku, the members of the selection panel, and my colleagues in the Václav Havel Library for making this occasion possible despite the enormous challenges posed by the pandemics of COVID-19. In the end, the cause of the struggle for human rights in general and women's rights in particular prevailed, as it must, over adversity. Last and most importantly, let me congratulate the dream team of this year's finalists and the laureate, the runners-up Julien Lusange of Congo, a brave fighter against sexual and gender-related violence, and the nuns of the Drukpa order who use their bicycles and their kung fu skills to spread the message of human rights and fight against trafficking in women all across the Himalayas. And most of all, 
Let me congratulate this year's laureate, Lujain Al Hatlul, an incredibly courageous Saudi women rights activist who has stood up for her convictions through years of imprisonment, abuse, and torture. I bow to you all. Thank you. Let me now ask a distinguished jurist of the Constitutional Court, the ultimate judicial authority in the Czech Republic, Honorable Katerina Šimáčková, for her message to the finalists and the laureate, the conference, and women everywhere. Thank you. Dear laureate of the 2020 Václav Havel Human Rights Prize, Miss Lujain Alhatalul, dear finalists, dear friends of human rights, dear all. First of all, let me congratulate Lujain Alhatalul for being awarded this year's Václav Havel Human Rights Prize. I salute her courage and determination in fighting for human rights under extremely difficult conditions. I also congratulate the finalists, the nuns of the Drukpa Order and Madame Julienne Lusenge. And I'm very delighted that all the candidates shortlisted for this year's prize have been women who deal with the protection of women's rights. Although we live in a democratic society, the current COVID pandemic is showing us that uh, there are still many outstanding deficits in the area of women's rights. Most of the persons working in caregiving professions are women, be it nurses, physicians, or social workers in nursing homes. During the lockdown, it is mostly women who care for children, sick persons, persons with disabilities or seniors, both at home and in institutional care. Despite this, women's experience is not sufficiently reflected in the anti-COVID measures because women are not sufficiently represented in positions of power. Last year, I published a book about women's rights together with my co-editors Barbara Havelková and Pavla Špondrová with papers by more than 40 authors. The title of the book is Male Law, Are Legal Rules Neutral? And we point out that although legal rules seem to be natural, they tend to reflect the life experience of men rather than women. From the perspective of laws or international treaties, a man serves as a rule and a woman remains an exception from the rule, an aberration. In theory, women have equal access to high functions, but only if they accept the rules of the game. And these were set in the past exclusively by men. The rules of the game are usually more difficult to follow for women, especially if they want to combine their private life and their working life to fulfill their role of a mother and uh, at the same time to be successful in their career, since women who care for others are usually not among those who make the rules, the society tends to overlook vulnerable persons as well as those who care for them. The underrepresentation of women in positions of power is also problematic for another reason. 
the society simply does not make uh, full use of its potential. I realize this problem every day at work because I am one of the two female judges out of 15 judges of the Czech Constitutional Court, although 61% of all Czech judges are female, when we look at the apex courts, women are strongly underrepresented. Nevertheless, young Czech female lawyers have had a number of excellent role models in the past. For example, Milada Horáková, a respected politician who was executed for her opinions during the communist regime or Angela Kozáková Jírová, who was the first European female notary. Between the two world wars during the first Czechoslovak Republic, our country was one of the best in Europe in promoting women's rights and the respect for women's political and professional activities. Women like Milena Jesenská and Františka Plamínková were among the leading European campaigners for gender equality and women's rights. Also later, during the activities related to Charter 77, women had a one-third representation among the leaders of the movement and it is appropriate to recall their names. Marta Kubišová, Zdena Tominová, Marie Hromádková, Anna Marvanová, Marie Rud Křížková, Jana Sternová, Eva Kanturková, Petruška Šustrová, Anna Šabatová, Libuše Šilhánová, Dana Němcová. Some of them were also members of the Committee for the Defense of the Unjustly Prosecuted, together with Ota Bednářová, Jarmila Bělíková, Elžběta Lederová, Gertruda Sekaninová Čakrtová, Zina Freudová and Lenka Marečková. And today it is also not difficult to find inspirational female lawyers who not only serve in important functions, but whose influence is respected by the entire community of legal professionals. Even today, our society is still governed by rules which were set in the past. They were set by men, in a way convenient for men, more specifically for men who act according to a traditional image of a man. A system which is running by these rules is then open to both men and women. If women can conform of this arrangement, they can have the same opportunities as men. Most of the members of the society perceive the current arrangement as natural given and therefore correct not to be changed or challenged. But the current arrangement was put in place in the past. At the beginning of the 20th century, men had 100% of the power over the creation of rules and over their interpretation. Only men could vote and be elected. Only they could study law at universities or serve in important and prestigious positions. Today's legal rules originate in an era when the society accepted that women were in a weaker position compared to men. Today, those legal rules may contribute to the existence of an unpleasant glass ceiling, impeding the freedoms of many women and men. And still, these patriarchal and androcentric rules are very often perceived as objective and neutral. Feminists, that means men and women who want to challenge these rules, are then seen as activists demolishing this neutrality 
in order to support women or in order to limit other persons' freedom. But this freedom is only illusory freedom if, in, on, if it only belongs to some persons. The doctrine of human rights sometimes puts in contrast two values, freedom and equality. It almost seems as if more equality amounted to less freedom. The privileged ones may perceive it this way, but those who have been excluded feel that their right to equal treatment goes hand in hand with their path to freedom. In other words, the emancipation of slaves is an interference with the property rights and with the freedom of the slaveholders. But it is also the only way for the slaves to gain freedom. I recall a global congress of female judges in Madrid at which I participated about two years ago. I presented the problem of the pay gap in which the Czech Republic is one of the biggest culprits in Europe. This Congress hosted not only European female judges, but also representatives from Africa, Near East or Middle East. Our European troubles concerning, for example, the underrepresentation of women in the management of companies or the lack of understanding for the gender-based domestic violence sometimes seemed almost improper when compared to the horrible experience of women in refugee camps in Yemen or Syria. I am overwhelmed with similar emotion when I read the stories of the laureates of this year's Václav Havel Prize, the stories of women who have faced the risk of imprisonment because of their freedom to drive, drive a car, women who have protected the victims of violence and rape, or women who have helped the victims of uh, humiliation to gain self-confidence. It reminds me of one text in our book about male law, a text which pointed out that perpetrators of sexual and gender-based crimes committed mostly during international or internal armed conflicts began to be brought to justice only when women became members of the relevant international tribunals. The effort of uh, every single woman to contribute to equality can help women in other countries and in other situations to reach for more freedom and equality. And uh, what matters the most in the end is our awareness of the, the need of mutual solidarity and sisterhood.
Greetings from the library of former uh, President of Czech Republic, Václav Havel. Uh, uh, today is my great honor uh, to talk to Lina Al-Hathlul, a, uh, a lawyer, a Saudi uh, activist for women and in general human rights. We'll be talking about uh, the situation in Saudi Arabia as well as the situation of her sister, uh, Lucien Al-Hathlul, a very prominent uh, women's rights uh, activist who's recently been released. Something very important changed. You've been here, the voices have been, the, the voices of, of dissent have been there for for decades but uh, the October 2018 murder of Jamal Khashoggi uh, a, a very important critic uh, 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 or loyalist turned critic uh, uh, maybe change the thing so currently when uh, there is this example of a grueling let's say revenge of of the of the royal court uh, in Riyadh uh, how does the diaspora and, and, and yourself and your colleague fighting for, 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 for human rights uh, in the kingdom, how do you feel about it? Um, I, will, I will say honestly and uh, very, uh, be very transparent. Um, before, um, you know, the Khashoggi case, um, you know, ironically, instead of making us all more scared, um, it just broke the wall of this fear we had because at some point we just said, okay, it's not possible to be scared anymore. Otherwise, we're the next person to be killed. I mean, before Khashoggi, to be honest, I, I didn't want to to seem too coordinated or, you know, too too much uh, close to the Saudi dissidents, the Saudi activists. So I was just, you know, uh, talking about what I, I think was un in, unjust in the country without really being friends with them or, you know, talking to them or participating to conferences. But after the murder, uh, there's something that happened where we said, enough um, enough fear. Uh, they, they, they cut a journalist into pieces. Why are we so scared? What are we scared of? Um, so at some point, you know, um, it really made the, um, our voice stronger because we came together and we said we have one aim now is not to be killed by a, by a dictator. Um, and th that's the only thing that gathers us. You know, we, we have so many different opinions. Some of them are religious, some are liberal, some are. So really, it really gathered us into one goal, which is uh, really uh, stopping this um uh, uh, repression and uh, this impunity in, 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 in the most horrific crimes. So yes, I will say that the Khashoggi murder was a point where, uh, after which um, uh, everything became more uh, gathered and uh, organized. Welcome to Václav Havel's uh, library. My name is Petra Zavadil and I will lead an interview for you with uh, Madame Julienne Lusenge from the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, who is one of the nominees for the Václav Havel's prize. Madame Lusenge, ça va faire plus de 20 ans euh, que vous avez créé ou co-créé l'organisation, euh, l'association Sofé Padi. Euh, qui, euh, au Congo, ou dont le but principal au Congo est de promouvoir les, les droits des femmes et notamment de faire cesser les viols. Est-ce que vous pourriez nous présenter un peu plus en détail euh, le travail que l'association et vous personnellement faites Oui, merci beaucoup. Évidemment, un peu de temps. Présenter un travail de 20 ans, c'est n'est pas... On n'aura pas assez de temps. Mais je peux dire en résumé, sauf pas dit depuis sa création, nous nous sommes engagés vraiment résolument à lutter contre l'impunité des crimes, des violences sexuelles ou des violences basées sur le genre. Et nous avons organisé plusieurs 
réunions pour sensibiliser les communautés autour de ces questions. Mais aussi, nous nous sommes engagés à impliquer les femmes dans la recherche de la paix. Parce qu'en 2000, quand nous avons créé Sofepadi, en Itouri, où nous étions basés, il y avait beaucoup de crimes, il y avait la guerre interethnique et les gens s'entretuaient et il y avait beaucoup de déplacés, des femmes avec les enfants dans la rue sans assistance. Et donc, nous avons mobilisé les communautés pour assister les femmes. Nous avons organisé plusieurs rencontres pour rencontrer les délégations qui arrivaient à Litouri pour leur expliquer les, euh, que nous, les femmes, nous ne voulons pas de la guerre. Nous avons passé des émissions pour dire non à la guerre. Demander aux femmes de ne pas donner les enfants pour les groupes armés. Et aussi, nous avons profité de ce moment pour documenter les crimes graves qui ont été commis à Litouri, qui rentraient dans les mandat de la Cour pénale internationale. Nous avons soumis quatre rapports. Nous sommes allés très loin pour aller chercher les victimes qui s'est cachées très loin après beaucoup de, de, de souffrances avec les, les différents groupes armés. Nous, avons, nous les avons rencontrés. Nous avons documenté les histoires. Nous avons amené ces témoignages au niveau de la Cour pénale internationale. Nous avons aussi retiré des enfants qui étaient dans les groupes armés qui étaient utilisés dans les hostilités, mais qui étaient aussi utilisés comme esclaves sexuels de leurs commandants. Nous avons retiré ces enfants. Et comme on n'avait pas un endroit pour les, les, les loger, nous avons dû les loger même dans nos maisons. Everyone can afford, everyone around the world. Welcome on the Havel channel. And I have a very special uh, opportunity to speak to a couple of uh, young ladies who are representing one of our uh, finalists of this year's prize the order of the Drukpa nuns. Let me welcome the two ladies. They are uh, Jigme Konjokla and Jigme Mengyula. When we went to villages, very remote villages, to give food, supplies and the pollen and tents and stuff, that time we really saw girls like being taken away. Or uh, they are not told, the parents are not told they have been sold or they are being like trafficked they are told that they would be given a good job and good job means money. So they don't have money at that time. So at that time we really saw it and we, we really thought that that cause was very, very like serious. So we, uh, that the cycling thing, you know, the cycling thing really came from that. We cycled from all these remote uh, regions from Kathmandu to Ladakh, educating people in the villages, talking to them, staying in each village for a day and talking to everyone. Why, where is the girl child? How many children they have? You know, why are the girl child not allowed to go to school? In some places, they don't allow girls to go to school. They're not allowed to come out to talk to us. And we are educating them. Why not? You know, Why not? Why not your girls are talking to us? Why can't they come and talk to us kind of thing? And uh, sometimes they go to schools, talking to the people and educating them and stuff. So after that, uh, for the time being as uh, this pandemic and uh, a group of many nuns, you know, 400 nuns, we cannot take uh, too much of, um, like we cannot go out a lot because it's dangerous for everyone. The one person who goes out can get infected. So it's um, that kind of precaution, precautionist thing we have been doing. We haven't been going out at all unless and until we have a very important work to go out. So we don't have, we haven't been connected to the government at all about this thing, but I think uh, we would love to do um, some other projects with them on human trafficking, yes. And um, I think uh, what 
what we have experienced from our other yatras, we have been doing not only the Himalayan region one, we have been doing yatras in all around India a lot. And uh, the first time we went on cycle in a region in India called Odisha, uh, we went to a school where girls were sitting behind. And when we were talking, I mean, the first time when we were on cycle yatra, and next time when we went there to the same village for walking pilgrimage, the whole school, you know, they kept the girls in the front and boys in the back. And they were like, we give the girls equal chances. And we, you know, we tell them that you can do everything and you, you're allowed to do, you know. So it was very like heart touching for us. Yes, we cannot like change all of the world at once. It's very difficult, I understand. But, you know, that that small change in that small village and that small school, you know, it just lit everyone's face up and like, we are doing this again. We'll come here again, you know. This leads me to my last question. Uh, you seem to have demonstrated that humanitarian work and the struggle for human rights can also be fun. Do you, are you enjoying it? <laughs> I would say yes, it, it can also be a, a lot of fun actually, uh, like take it for our yatras, we visit different villages, different communities, different people, we experience different, different, different kinds of weathers, rainy, sunny, winter, cold, windy, you know, all those kinds, it can be fun, yes, it can be very fun, uh, like a lot of fun, but it can be very, very dangerous also, I would say, because we have like our life on a uh, pin you know we're taking our life on pins of cycle yatra it's, it's dangerous yes but yes it can be a lot of fun helping others actually you know even if we had one person on that particular day on a particular day it 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 gives us a different kind of joy you know so i think kindness is something that everyone can afford you don't have to give like billions of dollars to someone or millions of dollars to someone to help just a smile on someone being stressed, smile to them. That just changes their whole day, I would say. And kindness is something I think everyone can afford, everyone around the world. Welcome to the eighth annual conference on the occasion of the awarding of the Václav Havel Human Rights Prize. I'm Michael Zantowski and I'm speaking from the Václav Havel Library in Prague. Usually we would uh, organize this conference in a spectacular 13th century church that was restored uh, by Václav Havel and his wife Dagmar as a conference space and, and a meeting point, the Prague Crossroads. Because of the COVID-19 pandemics, uh, we have to do with uh, our cozy environment in the Václav Havel library and with the virtual attendance of thousands of uh, uh, human rights uh, supporters and activists uh, around the globe. So welcome again, and we will start with the uh, laureate. Uh, 
She's here in the guise of her sister, uh, Lina al Hatlul. Welcome, Lina. It's good of you to be with us. And Thank first you very of all, much. congratulations uh, on uh, uh, the prize to your sister and to you and the whole family. You must be very proud of your sister. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, of course, I'm super proud of her. Um, I'm still very sad I should be, I, I am the one representing her. I would have loved her to be able to come and thank you herself and be the ones answer, the one answering the questions. Unfortunately, she's not uh, free. Uh, she's only released of prison. And um, honestly, we have been seeing, uh, seeing it uh, since the beginning when she was arrested that um, have, um, the, to save her and to raise awareness. And so thank you very much for this award and uh, hopefully uh, she will be able to thank you sometime soon. Uh, tell me, Lina, can she follow the ceremony and the conference? Uh, is she with us at least as a silent witness? <laughs> Maybe it's better not to give details of what she Very does well. behind her computer. OK, I'm not going to pry, but just in case uh, you've seen the wonderful award that was presented uh, earlier in the day at the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. But there's another part of the award that uh, goes with the award from the library. It's a, it's a special medal uh, with uh, Václav Havel's uh, 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 name and a symbol of the prize. So this will also go to your sister. Thank you. Now tell me, how important is the prize to her personally and, and to her struggle, to her fight for human rights? <laughs> Yes, I think to answer these questions, maybe um, I should uh, put in context um, Lujain's arrest and what the regime has tried to, to do with her. So when Lujain was first arrested in 2018, there was a huge defamation campaign in, in Saudi newspapers say that she was a, a traitor, that uh, she was a, an agent, and that um, you know she, she will get the sentence that is needed. And at some point, we really didn't know. Uh, and she was held in comunicado. She wasn't in an official prison. She was being tortured. And it was really, and there was an issue um, with, within the Saudi system. So Saudi Arabia would never, not, not even answer our letters saying that she's a traitor and that's it. So at some point, we said, OK, if we cannot um, resolve this problem within Saudi Arabia, we need the international community to do something and to help us. So once we, we, we started to speak and um, she started to have um, recognition and uh, people acknowledged that Saudi Arabia was, was um, being um, unfair towards her, um, this is when it opened up a bit and we started to have visits to Jane. She, she could be able to speak about the torture. And uh, finally, a, re a trial started because at some point she was only imprisoned without even having charges. Um, and so the more she was recognized, the more people you know, uh, told Saudi Arabia, we don't believe your defamation campaign. And Jane is a human rights defender and she, she should be celebrated and applauded. That's when Saudi Arabia realized that they cannot go on with this line anymore, and they, that they, they they tried to, uh, you know, put charges that are uh, a bit vague and absurd, and so the more prices she got, the the better treatment Lujain had, and the the more strength it gave her, and because she knew and she realized that people also were supporting her, she was able to, to say everything that happened in prison and also save the others that were imprisoned with her. So I think that now um, that there's no issue with the, the Saudi regime, that they don't want anyone to talk to them and that they, they, um, they have, they've been uh, repressing their people more than ever. Uh, the only thing that saves Saudi people is international recognition. Well, you just answered another of my questions. Uh, uh, the system of uh, male guardianship does not involve only driving, of course. It affects every aspect of a woman's life. 
and it is being justified by the religious doctrines and traditions. So in the light of that, uh, how uh, realistic it is to uh, hope for the system to change, for the system to become more liberal and more free? Um, it, the question is about uh, how hopeful we are. I mean, uh, what we see now is um, a, a new regime. So under Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, um, the, um, the cover of this repression is not religion anymore. Uh, now um, he says that he's a reformer and to, to be able to do these reforms, he has to be a bit harsh on some people. But what we see is that it's not true because even the reforms he, he, he talks about or he, he, he tries to, to make seem that he's advancing things are not real, are not institutional and have not been um, concretized. So, uh, for example, um, many Western, at least um, newspapers said that under Crown Prince Hamad bin Salman, um, the male guardianship system eased which is true for some things, for example, driving, but again, he imprisoned the people who have been fighting for it. And what we have also seen is that now women can travel without the consent of their male guardian, but nobody talks about um, the, the veto the male guardian has. So, okay, now women can travel, but the male guardian still has this power of disobedience law. Uh, so he can call the police and say, my daughter or my wife traveled without me accepting. Um, so, you know, all the new freedoms that have been given and uh, that MBS brags about to the West saying that he has eased the, the male guardianship system, it's not true for the ones in Saudi Arabia who has a male guardian who doesn't accept these new freedoms. So it's always, um, every, everything is countered to, 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 to make the situation remain as it has always been. Uh, and just to have this image of a reformer, but uh, inside of the country, women are still under, uh, under the same repression. Well, the notorious case of uh, Jamal Khashoggi uh, shattered the reputation of the kingdom as a modernizing uh, liberal monarchy. And apparently one of the men involved in that case was also uh, involved in the brutal investigation of uh, your sister. How much power do people like these have? Uh, can they act independently or, or, or do they only take orders from the uh, authorities uh, above? Well, since um, Hamad bin Salman took, pay, took power in uh, 2015, um, it's almost impossible um, that uh, people can do things without his consent. Uh, of course, you know, we don't have any um, explicit or direct uh, in, um, information about this, but what we can see is that the, his closest people, so for example, Saud al Ghattani, who is involved in the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, he was there uh, in the investigation of my sister, and he, he was the one ordering the torture and uh, making fun of my sister, um, telling her that if he wanted to, he could kill her and cut her into pieces and throw her body in the, in the switch system without anyone asking about her. And we, at that time, um, when Lujain was being tortured by this man, um, he was untouchable. Uh, when I, even when he tweeted something, he would arrest the people who were answering his tweets and put them in prison. So um, Lujain having the, the one of the strongest men of the country torturing her, I don't honestly, it's uh, just uh, uh, unbelievable unbelievable how uh, brave and resilient she has been uh, while um, these people were in front of her and torturing her. So um, yes, it's a, a, a small number of people leading the country and um, they are um, as murderers. Yes, unfortunately. Lena, your sister is a very brave woman and for what it counts we applaud her and stand with her and support her in her struggle uh, may she be blessed and uh, thank you now ladies and gentlemen we will enlarge our panel and we will invite uh, 
uh, the other finalists to join us. Uh, uh, they are Madame Julienne Lusenge from Congo and uh, uh, sisters of the Drugba order uh, from uh, Nepal. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome. Uh, <clears throat> the, I should introduce the sisters by name. Also, they are uh, uh, Jigme Kochokla and Jigme Mingyurla. They <laughs> My old friends now, we oh. <laughs> spoke about uh, two weeks ago. And uh, uh, congratulations to you and congratulations to Madame Lusenge on, on making the Merci. finals. Uh, and as I said in my uh, introduction earlier on, I mean, you're all mm -hmm. equally deserving. I, I wish we had three prizes uh, to give. But now, let me ask uh, a few questions to, to the panel. Uh, what, in your opinion, is the highest priority today in the struggle for human rights, not just women's rights, but in the struggle for human rights around the world? Anyone? Madame Lusenge? Merci. Euh, la lutte pour la promotion des droits des femmes à ce moment dépend des contextes dans lesquels les, les pays évoluent. Avec l'apparition la, de COVID-19, nous avons vu augmenter les inégalités entre les hommes et les femmes et nous avons vu aussi l'augmentation des violences Rise in violence, in domestic violence, in rapes, and other uh, things that concern uh, women and uh, young women. For example, uh, there are uh, many women get pregnant without wanting it. And therefore, for us, uh, it is important to uh, strive for peace and to involve women in this fight. We want justice to help us to con convict uh, crime perpetrators. Okay to convict all the perpetrators involved uh, who contribute to this mentality and who commit these crimes. We need to empower women because otherwise they will be always vulnerable. We need to empower them physically, but more so in their minds so that women can fight, can defend themselves, can express themselves freely and enjoy their rights. Mm -hmm. okay. To have resources for that, to sustain themselves. Because if they don't have resources, it is very difficult to be autonomous and have your, enjoy your rights. In our context, uh, women need always need help from their uh, husbands if they want something. And of course, that makes them all the more vulnerable. Uh, so for me, the priority is fight against violence and injustice. Right. Uh, about Kochok and Mingyur, how do you liberate women in their minds? This seems to be your speciality. How uh, do you go about that? Uh, I think when it comes to like uh, telling a woman to be more powerful, to be more confident, to be more outspoken, 
it is uh, like people talk about women em empowerment all the time you know people like always say uh, we are giving them a chance as women empowerment but we don't believe in this concept of women empowerment because it's something like uh, empowerment means like someone is giving us the power you know someone is passing us the power down but that's not true we believe that every woman every woman has a special power in it and in herself that only uh, comes out when we give them support, proper support, proper opportunities. We listen to them. And uh, there are many, uh, like many times, there are people who don't really uh, like consider women as a, uh, a person to go to, you know, a person to listen to. So I think that's very important that they give the chance, they give the right chance to a woman to speak at least, to give her ideas at least, you know. So I think uh, the, uh, the, uh, the main thing I think is women should be more stronger inside, more resilient inside, like uh, our own award winner, Ms. Lushen. I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name right. I'm sorry. But I think she is, uh, I don't know, for today, I think she is the biggest example a woman can have in her life. You know, she has like been through such a bad time, but she has been so strong and she's still there and she's still going to do so much. And I think that's, an, that's a great example. And uh, we are ourselves very, very uh, encouraged by her, very, very happy that she got the prize. She is a very deserving candidate. I, I would, see. And uh, yes. she, she did a great job. Uh, I can just imagine what she has been through, you know. Uh, we don't even have words to say, you know. I was very shocked when I heard about it. You know, people don't know what's happening around the world. Not everyone knows what's happening around Saudi Arabia, what's happening in Congo. Like today I was really like everything lit up and uh, we got to know about someone who has been doing so much. So I think what is important for a woman or a girl is to believe in herself, believe in what she is doing, believe in the act she has been doing and just keep going. Whatever happens, you know, when our uh, deserving candidate, our winner, got through such a harsh time in her life, I think every woman can do it. Every woman around the world is capable of winning, is capable of, capable of doing what she wants to do. Well, you each mm -hmm. brought a slightly different perspective uh, to the table. And with it, so many serious and chronic problems in various parts of the world, be it sexual violence, be it gender-related violence, be it uh, war-related violence, justice for uh, women, unwanted pregnancies, uh, trafficking in women, uh, in the Himalayas and uh, in other parts of the world. And obviously, these problems are related and interact with each other. So is there an awareness of uh, this complexity of the problems in your country and of uh, the importance of exchanging information and supporting each other around the world, international uh, cooperation involving global human rights organizations and, and so on. Lina. Yes, um, I think more and more um, Saudi women um, and at least feminists and the, uh, the feminist movement realize that it's not only about Saudi Arabia, uh, it's a different level. And as um, Julien Lesange just said, um, problems also have to be managed um, regarding the, the context and the circumstances women are in. Um, and um, the, the, the Saudi feminist movement, I think, feels close to the Arabic feminist movements. And uh, there are more and more interactions between uh, the, the whole Arabic world and saying that um, you know, the fight for women's rights in Saudi Arabia is not possible when you know the, the the other women also in the Arab world suffer the same thing. So it's a global fight, and because the problems are similar with the male guardianship system, with the um, the marriage of minors. Um, 
for the violence, the abuses, the, the marital rapes. Um, Saudi women more and more interact with the other Arabs and um, try to empower one, of, uh, one another, of course, yeah. Uh, I think more and more people realize it's a global thing. How is that in Africa, Madame Lusange? What is the African perspective of uh, international cooperation for the rights of women? You mentioned the problems of justice and, and criminal justice in punishing the perpetrators of uh, uh, crimes against women. Uh, would you, would, could you envisage an idea of an international judicial body, uh, something like the International Criminal Court or the war crimes tribunals in uh, uh, parts of the world, including, uh, including uh, in some of your neighboring countries? Uh, uh, would that be a good idea to help women seek justice? Yes, if justice works as it should, if perpetrators are punished, it is the way to go. Because currently, um, this would demotivate, discourage other perpetrators. Of course, currently, some of the perpetrators were convicted uh, and then when they got out, they realized that it was not just an um, accusation from a woman, that it was an accusation and conviction um, stemming from um, legal system, from laws. So, so some perpetrators um, understood and raised, started to raise awareness with other men. But of course, there are some international bodies, such as the International Penal Court. But unfortunately, currently, uh, not all situations are reflected and not all cases can be uh, convicted because there is not enough evidence and there is not enough evidence for some perpetrators of crimes in Congo. We have, um, we have succeeded in winning some cases, but uh, in other cases, uh, we only received a conviction for crimes against uh, humanity and uh, sexual slavery. And even in one case, the perpetrator was acquitted of all charges, even though all of them committed the same uh, crimes. They uh, enslaved uh, village people, they mutilated people, they were murdering. Uh, but unfortunately, currently, the judicial system does not have the powers to uh, rule or give the same rulings and sentences to all of them. That is why what we know, what we see currently is that some chief militaries, chief soldiers already count on the fact that the International Penal Court is uh, weak, that it's even uh, weaker, less strong than in Congo. We need to make sure that these international judicial bodies work as they should. And we also need specialized courts within countries, um, a similar court in Rwanda, in Congo, and so on, that would be in charge of convicting perpetrators on site and punishing them as soon as possible. We also organize mobile court hearings. Uh, that is a possible way to do, to conduct it in the village where a 
particular crime was uh, committed. And one day I was contacted by a woman who deeply appreciated this uh, initiative. And she told me that the fact that the punishment was voiced, was uh, presented in the village where the crime was committed, helped her and it restored her dignity. Because dignity is very important and restoring dignity of victims is crucial. That is why we need courts in our countries to convict perpetrators in the presence of those who live in the villages where uh, those crimes are committed, because this will help women, whole communities, and uh, other perpetrators uh, will better think twice between before committing similar crime in the future. Thank you. Uh, on uh, uh, another uh, angle, uh, in 2011, uh, the Council of Europe initiated uh, the so-called Istanbul Convention uh, on uh, preventing and combating violence against uh, women and domestic violence. And some of the member countries, including my own country, uh, have not yet ratified the convention. And some, like Turkey, uh, withdrew from the convention uh, recently. And the, controversy around the convention revolves around uh, the concept of gender and uh, gender rights, especially for some of the LGBT plus groups. Uh, your countries obviously are, are not members of the Council of Europe, but uh, in your own opinion, would you advocate a, a global convention on preventing and combating uh, violence against women and domestic violence, and what obstacles and objections uh, you would expect in, in trying to do so. Lina? Yeah, I can start. So for Saudi Arabia, I would say um, it's not about um, signing convention. It's not about having on paper uh, good laws, because when we look at all the codes, when we look at the, the, the regulations and conventions Saudi Arabia signed, most of them, when we look at it, it's not really problematic. The, the, pro the problem is really in, um, in um, respecting uh, all these laws and having uh, also accountability for the people who violate uh, these regulations and conventions and national laws. Um, when we see, for example, uh, just to get back to my sister's case, for example, when she got arrested, you know, it was very easy for Saudi Arabia's um, ministers and uh, the crown prince himself to say that uh, Saudi Arabia has this convention and that the laws say this and this, which is true. Um, you know, on paper, it's almost perfect, I would say. Um, the problem is how it's interpreted and how um, when someone violates it, there is no accountability at all. Um, so I, I would say that um, given Saudi Arabia now uh, under Crown Prince MBS, um, the most important thing for their legitimacy and for um, staying in power is uh, to, to seem like they're open and reformers. So I would say that probably now they would sign such a convention knowing that they, they, they can not respect it without any accountability. Um, and uh, I will just get back to Mrs. Lissange's uh, point about uh, impunity. I really think, as she said, so she talked about um, tribunals. I will also talk about something else. Um, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Um, there is still impunity and um, the crown prince and the people who are involved in this are still all walking free. And this is what makes them uh, empowered even more because, you know, saying MBS didn't do it is not, is, is, is better than saying MBS did it, but we won't we won't sanction him. Um, so having this impunity um, makes them um, walk free and continue with their violations and you know sign conventions and act like they want change. But in reality, nothing changes because nobody can can uh, punish the perpetrators and violators of these viola uh, the, these conventions. All right. Uh, uh... I understand, but my question was also aimed at uh, 
some of the minority uh, problems related to gender issues uh, and especially those revolving around the alternative lifestyles, the LGBT plus groups, uh, etc. I'm, I'm, I'm interested, how is the Drugba order seeing uh, this type of uh, uh, cultural lifestyle and, uh, and orientation? Do you have any problems with that? You mean with the LGBT uh, yes. group? Yes. So I think uh, when it comes to that, I think it's a personal choice. Every person has a personal choice to make. And I think it's, uh, to us, it's as normal as uh, it should be, you know, it's normal. I, I don't think it's abnormal or it's something out of the world because it's your own personal choice, who you like or who you want to uh, have a life with, you know? So I don't think there is a, uh, there should be any problem with uh, such uh, like LGBT or any kind of, you know, like that kind, there shouldn't be a problem. And uh, recently India also made a law that it's legal, you know? So I think uh, uh, every country, I'm, I, I don't know if all the countries are like okay with it or not okay with it. I think now most of the countries are getting way more accepting, you know, they are, they are accepting what it is because you cannot change every person, you know, you have to accept what they are, how they are. And I think to us, it's uh, as normal as it's to you, I would say. I think Europe is way more open than India and other countries, I would say Europe and all the Western countries, I guess are way more uh, open to such, um, such conventions, I would say, such uh, things, you know, uh, and uh, people uh, in like our countries in the Himalayas haven't much heard of it. But I think if they they are like they they start hearing about it now, like because of the internet, everybody knows like the world news what the world wants to show. So I think people are getting more accepting on this concept. Thank you. Mm. In your work, uh, Madame Lusenge, uh, you observed the close relationship between uh, war and violence against women. And uh, uh, the often ignored fact that much of the sexual violence against women during war is also politically motivated. It's not just sexual, it's uh, it's an expression of, of power, of tyranny, of superiority, uh, which is politically uh, uh, motivated. Uh, so is, is peace a prerequisite for uh, making women secure? Is, is, is this something that must happen if we are to prevent uh, further uh, violence when against really women in your part of the world? Should I repeat my question or we seem to have a slight... Unfortunately, my connection isn't stable. Uh-huh. Should I repeat the question? She says her connection is bad. Okay. Yes. Madame Lusange. I'm sorry, it didn't work. So I didn't uh, hear the whole question. All right. I, I was asking about what you mentioned previously Hello? about the relationship between war and violence against Hello? women, that some of the violence Hello? against women is Can also... you hear me? I can hear you now, I can hear you. Hello? Ah, we seem to have a problem oh. still. Oh. 
Okay, maybe we will, I will ask another question. I will ask uh, Kojok and Minjur about uh, uh, another problem and then we will come back to you. Uh, sexual trafficking in women uh, stems from the unequal position in, in many traditional societies, but it is also economically uh, motivated. Who are the perpetrators? I mean, are they mafias? Are they international networks? Uh, do they have any support from local or central government? And, and can you keep track of the uh, women who, are, who have been sold to traffic in? Are there mm -hmm. any practical ways to set them free and reintegrate them? Uh, in the societies? Uh, when it comes to, uh, I don't know who, <laughs> because it's a very, uh, I would say, a uh, question uh, which we are not very uh, familiar with, I would say, because uh, we don't know if who, who the person I think is doing, I guess they are internationally like linked and I don't know if it's a mafia or it's a, a group of people who are doing it, but I think they are having local help. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to get the girls from the remote villages. How would they know that there is a village and there are girls, you know? I think there is local help being given, but uh, we are not sure who is doing it and how to track them. I guess there are some NG NGOs in Nepal and India who track. I have, uh, I don't know like specific names, but I have heard there are NGOs who, who keep a track and uh, who have saved a lot of girls. But after saving the girls and getting, back, uh, getting them back to the community, you know, that's I think a more uh, challenging part for the girls also, because uh, people look at them as uh, some, you know, some alien coming from some uh, space, you know, but it's not true, they are humans. And I think that's a very, a uh, bad uh, kind of reaction we are giving them. We should be more accepting and we should be more loving towards them because they already have been through a hell. And uh, we being more like uh, bad to them makes them like feel more in hell, you know? So I think uh, as, a, as a girl, as a nun, as a person from the Himalayas, I think people are not very accepting when it comes to such things. And uh, when they come back, you know, it's very difficult for them to be in the community because people have a way of looking at them. And I think that's not right. And uh, it shouldn't be like that always. It, it, it should never be like that. And I, I would request all the people to be more accepting and to be more loving towards them, to be more generous. Like we said before, I think kind, you have to be kind. And kindness is something you don't have to pay for, you don't have to like buy it. You can just be kind to them. Just a smile would do, you know, just don't look down at them. I, I would just say that because how they are trafficked, how they are taken out of the country, I have no idea about it. And I think uh, that process itself would be so challenging for the girl. It, it, the process itself, you know, for the girl or not only girl, I heard there are children also being trafficked around the world. Because when we were in London for a trust conference, I heard there are like millions of children every year who are trafficked to uh, do work in factories, to do work for big companies. So I think all these kinds of things should stop, but we, don't, we have no idea who is doing it. But I am very sure they are getting local help. Otherwise, how would they know? And I think uh, when they come back, we have to be more accepting, more kind, more generous towards them than being uh, rude to them, than being bad to them. And do you have any idea where they end up? Are there any specific? Uh... So I, I, uh, I personally, I don't know where they go, but uh, from the news, from the internet, uh, I hear they go, most of them are taken to Malaysia, Dubai, I'm not sure, but that's what NET says. So who knows, you know, we don't know. That's what I'm saying. We just know what the NET tell, like the internet tells us 
we don't know i, I like we never heard about julian we never heard about lena you know because we we are we only see what internet wants to show us so that's the thing that's uh, we have seen that they they are taken to dubai you know but how are they taken to dubai that's that's a whole hidden process so nobody knows about it <laughs> so that's the like the sad thing you know that that's the sad part well we certainly want to show you but uh, 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 madame lusenge is the connection better now can you hear me now better Oui, maintenant je vous attends, mais yeah. ma connexion est vraiment instable. Yes, it's better, but it's really unstable. I'm sorry for that. Wonderful. Uh, I was asking earlier about the relationship between uh, between war and violence against women. Uh, uh, it is often ignored that the motifs of violence against women during a war are not just <laughs> sexual, but also motifs of power, superiority, uh, uh, politics, etc., etc. Uh, uh, is peace a precondition for stopping the violence against women? Can you do that without peace? Well, obviously, the problems persist. I'm very, very sorry about that. So I will uh, come back to Lina and something that uh, the sisters just mentioned. Many women victims of sexual violence are victims twice. Not only were they abused by the uh, perpetrators, uh, but they are also often subsequently stigmatized in their communities, in their families. They are not accepted uh, back into the families and sometimes they are even punished and punished very harshly. Uh, uh, how important is the education of the uh, society at large, so that they are not punished twice if they already been abused. Thank you so much for the, this question. Actually, um, it's a whole different level in Saudi Arabia, uh, because not only are they stigmatized, um, but there is what we call also care homes in Saudi Arabia, which basically are prisons for women for um, women who dare um, talk about uh, the, the things they've been through. Uh, so sexual abuse, um, uh, uh, familial uh, threats. Um, and this care home is where they are, they are sent if the, the male guardian, who can also be the abuser, thinks she doesn't deserve to stay with him anymore. So no, it's not only, only about stigmatization and society looking at these people in a, in a, in a bad way. It's also the, the, the very laws and the, the society that punished them literally twice, not only because they're abused, but because they've been abused and talked about it, then they're going to this uh, prison that is called a care home. So I think that um, education, of course, is, um, um, is important, but uh, the most important thing in Saudi Arabia now is to allow people to educate um, young women that it's not right what they're going through and that you know uh, and um, asking for the the to close these care homes so when we see that Lujain for example my sister we're sorry we're going back to my sister again um, she was part of the people who were trying to 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 end these care homes and open real shelters for women who are victims of sexual abuse and domestic violence. Um, but this is one of her charges because she has been trying to advocate for the, for the end of this whole double uh, punishment, as you say. Um, so we see that in Saudi Arabia, it's a whole process that has to go through. Uh, education is, of course, important, but the, the, um, 
the most important thing now is to allow people to speak and to educate society and to not have it as a crime. So uh, for now, we are really far. And it's not only about stigmatization, it's about laws uh, punishing women twice. Yes, thank you. I will try one more time to uh, sound out uh, uh, Madame Lusenge, but I'm afraid we, we may have lost her. Yes, apparently we have lost her. Well, what can we do? Uh, well, thank you all so much. Uh, in our conversation, I think it was you, Kochok, who said something which I found very beautiful. Uh, kindness is something everyone can afford. Whether we are rich, whether we are poor, whether we are oppressed, whether we are free, kindness is something we can always uh, afford. So one of the ways we can help is to look for and find kindness in our souls and uh, to show it in our everyday lives, because unless we show it to others, it doesn't work, right? Well, thank you for that lesson and thank you all for being with us. Uh, it was a wonderful experience for me and I'm grateful to you. This is Michal Jantowski in the Václav Havel Library in Prague.